Well, it's Easter Sunday. We are so, so privileged to have uh, Jason and Kristen Perkins with us. Um, now, <clears throat> in typical Aussie fashion, Jason doesn't just go by Jason, he goes by Perko. That's a very Aussie thing, isn't it? So uh, you might um, possibly hear him referred to as that as the day goes on. But uh, honestly, uh, it's been a real privilege to get to know Perko these last probably six to 12 months. We've had plenty of interactions now. Um, a little bit about these guys. They were missionaries with um, Word of Life Australia, um, have led churches. They led an, a, a fantastic church actually in the US from 2015 to about 2020, but then got called back to Australia to lead what is the Irresistible Church Network. Now, that's something that we as a church a part of. It's, it's becoming gr a great support to our staff and um, to us as a church. And, um, and Perco just has a wonderful network around Australia of really brothers and sisters in Christ that encourage churches to be exactly that, uh, irresistible to the world that is around them. On top of that, Perco's really uh, grabbed a hold of emotionally healthy spirituality. And, um, and today is talking about uh, in essence, grace. And I know that's a, been a big part of his life. So he comes experienced and, and just so ready to share a great word with us here today. Can we just do what Catalyst does and welcome Perko as he comes this morning. Thanks, mate. Carl and Jess, thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I want to get something straight before we get going too far along this, uh, this little conversation we're going to have. Um, oftentimes, I have found that when um, somebody is invited to come and speak at a church like this, and then they come in and they, they strap one of these to their face, and then they, they put them up on a stage like this in front of people that are both in the room and some people that are watching online as well, Here's the trap that can easily be fallen into. People can sometimes think more of the person up here than they really should. And so I just want to tell you from the get-go, I feel as though we could just wrap up the service with everything that's already happened. Because for me, I was sitting down here, and I'll try not to do it again, but I was bawling my eyes out thinking about how kind and generous and gracious, the God of the universe has been to me to send his only son, Jesus, into the world, to leave the beauty of heaven and to come down to a painful place like earth, live amongst us, all because at the end of the day, he desperately, desperately just wants to be with us. That's really the message of Easter. And we could kind of pack it all up and just go home and just celebrate that today, that God in his love and kindness and generosity so desperately wants to be with us that he sent his son Jesus into the world. What an incredible, incredible gift. And you need to just know that I'm just another bloke on the journey trying to figure out what does it look like to live with Jesus in his presence every moment of every day, and I don't feel like I've figured it out, I don't feel like I've arrived anywhere, but for some reason people ask me to come and talk about it, so I'm thrilled, I'm thrilled to come and talk to you today about what it looks like to be with Jesus, because that's what this whole message is all about. I do want to make uh, a statement that could be a little controversial to get things started though. You may be watching online, or maybe you're here in the room, and perhaps the whole Christianity thing is brand new to you. Perhaps you're in church for the very first time. Perhaps somebody invited you this week and you, had, you actually responded to them. Are you sure you want your church building to burn down? Because if I show up, it is possible that maybe the thing will burn down. I don't know what your backstory is on the whole Christianity Bible thing and the whole Jesus thing, but here's what I think we can all agree on, if we're being honest. This thing we celebrate over Easter, this death of Jesus, his burial, and then his resurrection, even if, you, if, if that's a stretch for you, I get it, but he rose again from the dead. All of that thing that we celebrate at Easter, I think we can all agree, no matter our faith background or our church journey, 
that that moment in history was a pivotal moment in human history. It changed the trajectory of human history. Even if you're not sure if you believe it all or not, you would probably agree, Perko, yeah, I, I agree with you. It changed the trajectory of human history. I want us this morning to talk about this idea of pivotal moments that change the trajectory of our lives. But before we get to it in your life and in my life, I would love for us just to kind of do a, a quick review of some pivotal moments in human history. I'm a uh, PE teacher, by the way, by profession. And so um, that means that I know how to blow a whistle really well. I took a four-year degree on how to blow a whistle. It means that I also love to play games. So I would love to do this by playing a game this morning. Are you okay with that? So if you're able, if you're able, would you mind standing with me? We're going to play a game of face-off. It's a game, um, and today's edition of face-off is uh, what I would refer to as kind of pivotal moments in history. So just to give you an idea of how this works, we're going to bring up an image on the screen. And this first image is kind of an Easter face-off concept, all right? So if, if you were to uh, dye some eggs, all right, around Easter time, I want you to face the direction in which you would dye them, okay? If you would go with pastel shades, I want you to face that direction, okay? Go ahead and you can do that right now. If you were to dye Easter eggs in bright, vibrant colors, I want you to face this direction. If you're still facing me, that just means you're anti-egg dyeing, okay? <laughs> and we can't do that on Sunday, Easter Sunday, all right? So if you're still facing me. So now you get the idea. That's what face-off looks like. Now, in this first round of the game, you can turn and face me now. There's no right or wrong answer for that first thing, by the way. That's a preference thing. Now we move to the part of the game where there is a right and a wrong answer, okay? And here's the way it works. If you're going to get two options come up on the screen in just a moment around a question, and you're going to pick which option you think is correct. You're going to face this way or that way. And at the end of, I'm going to count down from three, we're going to reveal the correct answer. Now, unlike... You know, some games, this is a game of elimination. So you will get eliminated. I know not every generation likes that kind of a sport where <laughs> not everyone gets it. Don't laugh, you could be in that generation, okay? So not everyone's going to get a trophy, but the people at the end of the game today, they're actually going to get a bunch of Easter eggs, okay? So make sure you stay in it because there is something to actually win, okay? So let's do this, let's do this. The first round is what I would refer to as kind of a grace round. It's a practice round, okay? So even if you get it wrong, you're gonna to get to stay standing and still be in the game. But unlike the grace of Jesus, it ends after the first round. It doesn't continue, all right? So you will get eliminated in the second round. All the church people in the room laughed. All the unchurched people, that's just simply a joke about how Jesus' grace goes on forever, okay? So here we go. First question around pivotal moments in human history. In what century did the information age begin, all right? In which century? Do you think it began in the 18th century or do you think it began in the 20th century, okay? Go ahead and pick which side you're going to face. Go ahead. Remember, if you're still facing me when I get down to one at the end of the countdown, you'll be eliminated if you're undecided. So here's, here's the timer. In three, two, one, the answer is... The 20th century. All right. Man, it, it doesn't take much in Ipswich to get people excited, does it? Just a simple game of, of face-off. This is good stuff. All right. Now, remember, that was, a, that was a practice round, so you're all still in it. Okay? You're all still in it. But the grace ends now. Okay. Second round. When it comes to pivotal moments in history, think of the Industrial Revolution. Which century do you think the Industrial Revolution began in? Do you think it was the 19th century or the 18th century? And we've got to speed things up a little bit. So you've got three. If you're still facing me, you'll be out. Don't want to point out anybody down here in the front row, but if you're still facing the front, you'll be out. In three, two, one, the answer is the 18th century. So all the 19th century people, go ahead and be seated. And if you are still facing me, you also were eliminated, so you need to be seated as well. All right, next, next uh, pivotal moment in human history, the agricultural revolution. Now, just notice something on the screen for a moment. Remember that kind of bold statement I said at the beginning that the birth, sorry, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ 
really changed human history, the trajectory of it. Notice that we've had to switch from 18th, 19th century to 10,000 BC because Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, his life literally was a pivotal moment in history that affects all of our dates today. So with that being said, which one do you think it was? 10,000 BC, if you think it's that way, face that direction. If you think it was 6,000 BC, I want you to face this. Now, agricultural evolution, this goes from, this was the change in human history where people were more nomadic hunters and gatherers, and they started finding permanent places to, to grow crops and that type of thing. The answer is in three, two, one, 10,000 BC. All right. So all the 6,000 BC people, you may be seated. Okay, the next round, let's go to the next question. Pivotal moments in, in, in human history, the scientific revolution, when things like astronomy and, and biology and things made great movements in human history and great changes. The medical revolution came out of this as well. If you think it was 17th century, face that direction. 16th century, face this direction. All right, and in three, Two, remember, if you're still facing me, you'll be eliminated. You've got to pick one or the other. Three, two, one. The answer is it was the 16th century. All right. So let's just see. We've got, I think, one person in this section. We've got a couple of people, a few people in the middle section, and a handful up the back here in this section. All right. Next round. When it comes to the age of exploration, okay, and uh, all of the empires of the world started to go all over and, and find new nations that they weren't really finding for the first time. People already lived there, but they, they found them, so to speak. Was it the 14th century or the 13th century? Go ahead and pick one. Which direction do you think it was? And you've got three seconds now. This is a tough one, all right? Three seconds. In three, anybody still facing the front? Two, one. And the answer is neither of those, okay? It's just my way of eliminating everybody else from the game. Was there anybody that thought it was the 15th century, for real? There was somebody up the back. And so, Nicole, would you do me a favor? Would you give them that bag of eggs and then share that amongst all the other poor people that just lost the game? That would be really helpful. Hey, you know what? When it comes to pivotal moments in history, here's what I've discovered. Not only do they have the power to change the trajectory of human history, but let's get a little bit more personal. I think pivotal moments have the power to change our history. They have the power to change your history and my history and the trajectory of my life. And I want you to just think for a moment. In fact, I'm going to put a couple of... Uh, uh, categories up on the screen, if you wouldn't mind. There's a few categories on the screen. Think about these categories and think in your own life, what's a pivotal moment or circumstance in your own life that literally changed the trajectory of your life? Think back over your life just for a moment. When I think about my life, it was actually somebody else's moment. My beautiful wife, Kristen, is sitting down on the front row. And she had, in the geographical category, a pivotal moment when she was 15 years old. Her family decided to move from New England, the northeast part of the United States, Maine and New Hampshire, and moved sight unseen, had never been to Australia before. They moved their entire family to Australia when she was 15 years old. Good news for me, I met her the first day she landed in Australia. Now, it took me about 10 years to grow up and not be a punk and convince her that I was a likable guy and mature enough that I actually asked her to marry me about 10 years later under the same tree that we met that first day that she moved to Australia. You talk about a pivotal moment changing the trajectory of someone's life. Her family moving to the other side of the world completely changed the trajectory of her life. And I think you've got a moment that probably has come to your mind just like that. So do me a favor. I know this may be a little unusual, but I'd love for you to turn to the person next to you, or maybe you came with a couple of people, and I want to give you just 30 seconds each to share that pivotal moment that changed the trajectory of your life with maybe the person next to you. If you're watching online, maybe find somebody in a coffee shop that you're watching this on, be really odd and say, hey, this is a pivotal <laughs> moment that changed the trajectory of my life. But go ahead and do that right now. I'm going to give you a moment to do that.
All right, your 30 seconds is up. Let the other person share their pivotal moment now. Go ahead and let the other person share if they haven't had a chance to. All right. If you have been around Catalyst, say, a few times in the last month or so, you'll know that here at Catalyst, they've been in a series of talks talking about different catalysts of an Acts 2 church or different catalysts, things that can help you grow in your spiritual walk and in your spiritual journey. And so I want to give you a quick recap, especially if you haven't been here in the last couple of weeks. This is kind of like joining the end of a Netflix kind of series. You're getting the last part. So I'm going to do a quick recap here. Here's what we've been talking about in this series of talk. Catalyst recap real quick. First thing we've been talking about is meeting people's needs can help you as a catalyst in your spiritual journey. It's an amazing thing that happens. Personal ministry is the next one that we've been talking about. When you get involved in serving, it's amazing how God will use that to grow your faith and be a catalyst in your spiritual journey. The next one has been personal ministry. Oh, sorry, private disciplines. Some private disciplines have already been talked about this morning. Carl, a moment ago, talked about this idea of being generous. That's a private discipline that oftentimes God will use to help be a catalyst and grow you in your spiritual journey. The next one was talked about was providential relationships. I think Brad last week talked about this idea of relationships. By the way, if you missed any of these, just like a great Netflix series, you can go to Catalyst website, you can catch up on all of it, watch it all yourself. But talked about this idea that oftentimes there's these providential relationships that God brings into our life and it helps us grow our faith. Today, I want us to focus on this idea of pivotal moments or pivotal circumstance, circumstances that God oftentimes uses to grow our faith. One of those for me in that spiritual category, that list of categories we had on the screen a moment ago, one of those moments for me actually happened decades before I was even born. And I'll, I'll tell this story, and I've told it many times, I've heard it many times, because it's kind of a, a story, a folklore story in our families. But there was a knock at a door on a Saturday morning in a small suburb just outside the city of Denver, Colorado, back in the 1960s. And there were two old ladies standing outside the door. They knocked on the door of my dad's home. He was seven years old. His family had nothing to do with church. My grandfather was the kind of person that, quite frankly, stories about Kim that have been told was he wasn't always the nicest guy to be around. And so on that Saturday morning, these two little old ladies knocked on the door and they invited this couple, my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather, and their children to go to church at the local church in their little town. Now, my grandparents, not being church people, said, no, we, we have no interest. And so these little old ladies, just persistent, were like, you know what? What if your boys came to church tomorrow morning and you could have the morning off? And so my grandmother immediately said, great idea. And my uncle and my dad started to go along to this church every single Sunday morning. You talk about a pivotal moment, not just in my story, but in the trajectory of my entire family tree, it changed everything. Because a few months later, my grandparents were invited to go to a special celebration Sunday morning. Because my uncle and my dad had been consistent in their attendance, they were getting some prizes. And so my grandfather and grandmother went along to see my dad and my uncle get these prizes. And on that Sunday morning, my grandfather had an encounter with the presence of Jesus that changed his life forever. And my grandmother as well. And the rest of that story literally is now all around the world simply because of a pivotal moment when somebody knocked on a door. That's all. Now, fast forward, my life was forever changed and my spiritual trajectory was forever changed by that moment. But here's what I've learned over the years. Pivotal moments, pivotal circumstances have the power to both better your faith but they also have the power to make your faith a little bit bitter. If I'm being honest, sometimes a pivotal circumstance, a moment in your life, have the power to better your faith, but it, it also has the power to bitter your faith. In fact, four years ago, 
If you were to tell me on Easter Sunday four years ago that I would be speaking in a church on Easter Sunday morning today, I would have told you you were out of your mind. Because in that time of my life, I had gone through one of the most painful experiences I had ever gone through to that point in my life, and the pain had come directly because of a church experience. And so I was beginning to ask this question, which a lot of people ask. In fact, you may be here today and you say, you know what, Jason, I'm not sure about this whole church thing, this whole Christian thing, because I wrestle with this question. This is the question I was wrestling with four years ago on Easter Sunday morning. The question was simply this, how can a good and loving God, how can I believe in that kind of a God when there is so much pain and there is so much suffering in the world? And it wasn't something I was asking the question about because I looked at other people's lives and thought, oh my goodness, there's so much pain and suffering in their lives. How can they believe in such a loving God? I was experiencing it firsthand myself and I was wrestling with this question. And as I wrestled with this question, came across this character, and you probably figured at some point, we're going to talk about Jesus at some point in this talk, right? We're going to get to the Easter story. It is Easter Sunday morning, right? At this moment in my life, I took great comfort from one of the very first followers of Jesus and his story. And I want to take you back there to the first century this morning. We're going to take a look at this particular person's life in a, in a couple of key moments that changed the trajectory of his life, both the good ones and the painful ones, because I think both of them are important for us to look at. This first follower of Jesus, one of the first, um, was in, invited to begin following Jesus, and we have a record of it from a guy named Mark. Even if you've never read the Bible before, you may be familiar with the, the four Gospels at the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the four accounts of Jesus' life that we have available to us to learn what his life looked like and how he lived his life. And Mark, I love Mark's Gospel because it's the shortest of them. So if you're thinking about reading one and you want a short read, that's a good one to start with. Mark's a great gospel. I also love the fact that Mark gets right into the story. He uses the word immediately over and over and over and over again all throughout his account of Jesus' life because Mark didn't like to beat around the bush. He liked to get into the story. And so at the very beginning of Mark's account of Jesus' life, we are introduced to the first followers that were invited to follow Jesus. In fact, let's read it together. I'm going to read it out loud up on the screen. You can follow along. It says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw a guy named Simon who later would become Peter. I'll get to that in a moment. And his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Two guys just there at the Sea of Galilee doing their regular job and they were fishing. And then the, Mark goes on. He says, Jesus said to them, come and follow me and I'll send you out to fish for people, which would have been strange for them, but we'll get to that. At once, it says, they left their nets and followed him. And then Mark continues. It says that when Jesus had gone on a little further, he saw James, a couple of other people, James, the son of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat. They too were fishermen. They were preparing their nets. And it says, Without delay, Jesus called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and they began to follow him. So this is the first moment that we see in Peter's life that literally changed the trajectory of his life. He decided, notice how Mark describes it, not to believe in Jesus. This is a key point. His first step was not believing everything about Jesus he didn't even know who Jesus was at this point. But he simply took a step and said, I'm willing to follow you and learn from you. I want to just invite you. Maybe you're struggling with the whole Easter story. And maybe the whole resurrection of Jesus thing, that's a big stretch for you. Can I encourage you, like Peter, not to take a gigantic step, but to take a step and just begin following Jesus and learning from him. That's exactly where Peter started. And it's a powerful step. In fact, that step led Peter on a journey to become one of the closest followers of Jesus. Many people had started following Jesus over the years of his ministry. Jesus decides to kind of put a stake in the ground and say, hey, these are the 12 that are going to be my disciples 
These are going to be my closest followers. I'm going to invest in them. You know whose name was first on the list? Peter's name was top of the list when he named his 12 disciples. James and John, who were invited at the same time in the story just a moment ago, the three of them, Peter, James, and John, they became kind of the inner circle amongst the 12. There were these three, kind of like the executive team within the management team. You got Peter, James, and John. The three of them are the closest followers of Jesus. And then we fast forward the story all the way to the week of Easter. And on Thursday night, These guys had been journeying with Jesus now for three years, watching him do ministry, watching him do the most incredible, the most insane miracles they had ever seen. For example, 5,000 people plus, sorry, 5,000 men plus women and children sitting in a field starving at the end of the day. Jesus says to these guys, everyone's hungry. You go feed them. They go out find two fish and five loaves and they come back and Jesus not only feeds all of these people, but there's 12 massive baskets left afterwards. I mean, they had seen the most incredible, the most insane miracles that Jesus had done. Fast forward now, on Thursday evening, they're having dinner together and it's Easter week. Now we get the benefit because we've heard the story and some of you, even if you've never been in church before, you've seen the painting The Last Supper painting, you know, the really big panoramic one. You've seen it somewhere, maybe online or at a museum somewhere. And at that supper, Jesus identifies that one of them at the dinner is going to betray him. Judas leaves the meal. We know the whole story now. We know that he went out to betray Jesus and tell the chief priests and the council where Jesus was going to be. But the rest of them, Jesus and the 11, they head out after dinner And they head off to what's called the Mount of Olives. While they're at the Mount of Olives, Jesus says something to the group that is incredibly, incredibly hurtful to them. In fact, Mark, the same guy who recorded the beginning of Peter's journey with Jesus, he records for us the conversation that Jesus had with the group. It says this. It says, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. Now, they've just spent three plus years with Jesus every moment of the day from sunup to sundown, spent every waking moment with Jesus, and Jesus makes this statement, you will all fall away. And then notice Peter's response to Jesus' declaration. It says, then Peter declared, even if all fall away, not me, Jesus, I will not fall. And then Jesus goes on to say, truly, I tell you, Today, yes, even tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. You talk about a pivotal moment in Peter's life. Jesus is calling him out. And then Peter responds. I love how bold and passionate Peter was. He says this, but Jesus insistently, emphatically persisted Even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same thing. Now, fast forward the story just a couple of moments later. They're now at the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night that Jesus is arrested. And the council come to arrest Jesus. And right before they arrest him, Jesus, uh, Peter pulls out his sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest who is coming to arrest him. Jesus rebukes him and says, hey, that's not what we're about. Jesus picks up the guy's ear, heals the man on the spot. Another incredible miracle. But Jesus is taken away. And Peter, I can only imagine, imagine what Peter's life was like. In this moment, I can only imagine Peter is devastated. In fact, I imagine maybe even Peter felt duped in that moment. I've just spent three plus years with this guy. He's been doing all these incredible miracles. He says he's the Messiah, the Son of God. He's going to save us as a nation. And yet he can't even stop these guys from arresting him. If I'm in Peter's shoes, I'm feeling duped. I'm feeling like perhaps I was sold a lie and I can't really trust this guy. That was what I was feeling just four years ago, to be honest. But then the story continues that Peter 
is just below where Jesus and the council are trying him and questioning him. And a young servant girl from the high priest comes and says, weren't you one of the guys that used to hang out with Jesus? And Peter, of course, denies it. He says, no, 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 that wasn't me. I don't even know who you're talking about. And then a second time they come to him and they ask him, weren't you one of the people that that hung out with Jesus? You traveled with him and so on. Peter denies it again. And then finally, they, they hear Peter talking. They can tell he's from Galilee. He has a weird accent, kind of like me. I've got this blended, mixed up, weird Australian American accent. You can't figure out where I'm exactly from. They knew exactly where Peter was from. They said, you're a Galilean. You've got to be one of them. Notice what Peter says. Mark records this for us. It says, he began to call down curses. And he even swore at them, saying, I don't know this man you are talking about. (coughs) Remember that word immediately that I said Mark uses over and over again? Immediately, it says, Mark's writing says, immediately the rooster crowed the second time, then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke (laughs) down and wept. I just imagine this is a pivotal moment in Peter's life. And it could change the trajectory of his faith. It could either be something that makes his faith better, or quite frankly, I think it had the opportunity, the power to make his faith bitter. And in this moment, I think he was pretty bitter. We've heard the Easter story this morning. That's what happened next. On Friday, Jesus was crucified. Saturday was Sabbath. They rested. And on Sunday morning, those two ladies went to the tomb to anoint his body with oil and spices. When they got to the tomb, we've already heard it, the stone had rolled away. And they went into the tomb and they were startled by this man that was in the tomb. And here's how the story played out. Mark tells us that this man said to the two ladies, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified, and I love this. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then the guy said to these two ladies, notice what he says to them, but go tell his disciples and Peter. Nobody else's name listed but Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So Peter and John and some others came to the tomb. They found that he wasn't there and they went off to find Jesus. Later on, In the story, we discover that Peter and his friends were back fishing where it all began. Remember, it all began on the Sea of Galilee. They were invited to come follow Jesus. They're out fishing again. And Jesus shows up on the side of the sea and invites them to come in. They they bring in a huge haul of fish. They're having breakfast on the side of the Sea of Galilee. You talk about a pivotal moment in Peter's life. This is a pivotal moment that will change the trajectory of his life. Jesus comes to Peter and he says to him, Peter, do you love me? And Peter responds, Jesus, of course I love you. Remember just a few days ago, he had just disowned Jesus and denied him three times. Jesus is kind of reinstating Peter here and asks him, do you love me, Peter? Peter responds, God, Jesus, you know I love you probably a little bit kind of startled by the question. And finally, Jesus asked him a second time, Peter, do you love me? I think Peter was probably annoyed this time by the question, not startled, but annoyed. And he responds to him, Jesus, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him a third time, and Mark records it for us. He says this, sorry, John records it. The third time he said to him, Simon, Peter, son of John, do you love me? Peter was not just annoyed or maybe startled by it, but it says that he was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then Jesus says something to Peter, which is a little bit odd, but it's really important for us to understand this truth. Jesus goes on to say this, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. 
but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Why would Jesus say such a bizarre thing to Peter? John tells us the answer. He says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him again, follow me. Here's the big idea that I want us to take away today. I want us to understand this big idea. Jesus never said that in this life, everything's going to be grand if you follow me. In fact, at the end of his life, Jesus says to Peter, you're going to die a very terrible death. History tells us that Peter actually died by crucifixion the same way that Jesus died, but he didn't want to go the same exact way. And so he, he was crucified upside down, an awful, awful death. Jesus never said, he never promised that in this life, you'll, you'll have a carefree life. In fact, he said the opposite. In this life, there's going to be trouble. But then he gave us this incredible promise that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. In my questioning of God's goodness and whether or not I can trust him, I've come to realize that pivotal circumstances in life have the power to either make your faith better or make your faith bitter. And so I want to ask you this question, this simple question this morning as we wrap up. How is pain and suffering in your life making your faith? Is it making your faith better like Peter, even though he knew terrible things were going to come to him? Or is it making your faith bitter? Or is it making you almost try to push God away from you? I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. In fact, Carl quoted C.S. Lewis earlier this morning. C.S. Lewis says it this way about pain. He says this, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. You can't ignore it. He goes on to say, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. At the very end of the Bible, there's this beautiful verse that I want to wrap up with and invite you to, in some ways, make a decision about this morning. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking and it says these words. It says, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door knocking. I stand at the door of your life and I'm knocking on the door. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, notice what he, he will do. I will come in and eat with them and they with me. Here's the invitation that Jesus wants to extend to you this morning. He would love to be with you. He'd love to be with you. In those pivotal moments that are great and they seem to make your faith better, in those pivotal moments which are painful and, and have the potential to make your faith bitter, He wants to be with you in both so that those pivotal circumstances can make your faith better. They don't have to make your faith bitter. I want to invite you to think about what's the decision I'm going to make today when it comes to my faith and these pivotal moments and pivotal circumstances in life. Will I allow them to make my faith better or am I going to allow them to make my faith bitter? And I want to invite you to choose the better not the bitter. Maybe this is a moment for you right now just to ask God, God, I want you to be with me in my life, in the highs and lows of life. Maybe this is a moment for you to invite God to be in your life in that way. Or maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a long period of time, but you've had some highs and you've had some real lows and you want to invite him into the pain of your life that he would be with you and to make your faith better in those moments. Let me pray for us as we wrap up our time together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the life of Peter, for the moments that we've seen in his life and the choices that he made not to make those moments cause his faith to become more bitter, but to make his faith even deeper. God, I'm amazed that when I meet somebody of great faith, it's amazing to me how oftentimes they're people that have gone through great pain. And God, I pray that you wouldn't allow the pain of our lives to push you away. But God, I pray that we would reach out in those moments that we might embrace you being with us. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. 
Amen.